you're on, Walter. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Community Camera. This is the ongoing series presented by the uh, Learning Resources Center here at Corning Community College, and I'm glad to have you with us today. If you've been following the series at all, you know we've been fortunate enough to have all of the visiting scholars. And uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to welcome to the program Tom Wolf. Tom, Thank you, Walter. Welcome very much. Uh, Tom is here on the uh, general theme of arts and entertainment into the 80s. And uh, I hope many of you looking in today were able to be there Monday night, or Wednesday night, rather, uh, for the talk at the gym. That was certainly most appreciated, I think, and, and fit into the, the, the pattern extremely well. I had, a really, I had a really good time. I found uh, Corning to be one of the most interesting colleges I've ever, I've ever visited. There's such a range of students who are really, I think, sincerely wrapped up in, in a wide range of topics, like the, uh, such as the arts, architecture, anything you mm -hmm. want to get onto. Well, we like to hear that, but we, we're also envied, certainly, by uh, other institutions in the state. I know when I go some to, to some of the state meetings and tell them about our visiting scholars, they get a little green with envy because uh, it isn't a typical happening, really. And that's good. Envy does them a little good. Gets the, gets the adrenaline going. I um, think it's good. Uh, uh, it's nothing quite as satisfying, I think, as to be envied. Don't you feel that's... In fact, uh, it could be very good as long as you don't fall into the trap of, uh, of feeling guilty about it. I suppose. So that's, that's true with so many yeah. things. <laughs> Guilt has been defined as a fear of being envied. Oh. Yes. Guilt, I suspect, is, is, the, is the factor that, um, probably the major factor why we should avoid sin if it weren't for guilt. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Wolf, as, as I'm sure all of you know, is uh, a journalist and uh, social critic and uh, author. I um, write stuff, as your, your latest, right. on the astronauts. and. Uh, and you're sometimes, uh, you lab you get a lot of labels, I'm sure, and, and I, I'm sure a lot of people use them about you rather uh, blithely, but also, I suppose, sometimes like all labels incorrectly. Uh, but new journalism, what is it, and to what degree are you responsible for it? Along about 1973, I began to feel that I had made a dreadful mistake in um, touting this genre of the new journalism because I found I'd built a little cage for myself. I'd, I'd started saying, I hadn't even written a book called The New Journalism, and I started saying, setting up these standards. And I found out that everything that I'd written was now beginning to be judged by these standards I had created. Uh, in fact, at that time, I took a vow, a kind of Trappist vow of silence. I said, I'll, I, what have I done? I will never open my mouth again on the subject of the new journalism. But I, what have vows if they're not meant to be broken? The, the new journalism, in my mind... Without guilt. Without guilt, yes. <laughs> A little envy, but not too much guilt. Um, in my mind, the new journalism was the use of every effective technique known to prose, including the most sophisticated techniques of the novel, such as stream of consciousness, in nonfiction, in journalism, without violating any of the standards of journalistic accuracy. So to me, it was a matter of technique, of using things like scene-by-scene -scene construction and using dialogue the way it might be used in a, mm -hmm. in a novel, um, using even stream of consciousness the way, even, the way Joyce might have, uh, might have done it. But I discovered that no matter how many times I said it was a matter of technique, I would see people and hear people saying, well, this new journalism is simply impressionistic prose, always written in the first person, using fictional devices, uh, half, using half fiction and half truth. And after about the 40th time I would hear this, after making all of my arguments and everything, I would finally just kind of give up and. Uh, and eventually take my, uh, my vows. But I'll tell you a good example of the difference between the old journalism and the new, and the new journalism. Perhaps this is the easiest way to define it. Um, 
When Woodward and Bernstein did their work about Watergate for the Washington Post, they first wrote it in what we might call the old journalism in the Washington Post, using the standard newspaper story technique of, it was learned yesterday from reliable sources that uh, former presidential aide, uh, um, uh, what, I can't remember their initials now, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, whoever, uh, did such and such. And everything is done in very formal, guarded, defensive, rhetoric and the story is turned, told upside down. The conclusions in the first paragraph, you gradually uh, that let, was let, always the, let the reader you know, Standard you know, advice, wasn't right. it? Grab them in the first. Uh, and and you, you, you end up having to put the story together backwards when you're through. Uh, later on, the same men, Woodward and Bernstein, wrote two books about Watergate. One is called All the President's Men. One is called The Final Days. And in those books, they used the techniques of what would be called the new journalism. Namely, they would uh, create scenes, but using real material. I mean, using mm -hmm. actual accurate material. They would, uh, they would create the scenes in which certain things happened. They would tell, uh, tell it in the form of a narrative. They would use dialogue if it was available. If, uh, and in many cases, it was. And you only have to compare the two versions, the same, and see the same technique written twice, once in the old I'll form, once that. in the new form. Uh, and you'll see the difference mm -hmm. between the new journalism and the old, and why it seemed important to me, uh, because the, the second version uh, is so much more vivid, brings, up about, brings to life so much more of human character uh, than you, is ever available in the old form. You know, while you were saying that, I was trained as a historian, and um, uh, history, or the, the great historians had a, something of a debate that's very parallel to what you're saying. There was, the, there was what Carlyle called the Dr. Dryasdust type, who mm -hmm. tried to be very objective in the writing, like von Ranke, uh, but, it, but it was very straightforward and, and factual and logical, but it, it didn't recreate scenes. Whereas Carlyle, of course, who was kind of a new journalist of his day or a new historian of his day oh. created scenes in the in the his book on the French Revolution of course those wonderful descriptions of the mob marching out to Versailles and so on and, and recreating scenes using some imagination as well as the fact oh some of the very best um, essayists of British history have really used mm -hmm. these techniques so it was never labeled uh, my favorite example is Boswell Oh, love now, Boswell and John Boswell's century. Johnson was a really a piece of reporting in many cases, and also a piece of news management in certain ways. Boswell would actually try to create situations in which Dr. Johnson would be forced to do something extraordinary so that he could mm -hmm. write about it. Uh, one of his great literary rivals was a man, if I remember his name correctly, I think it was John Wilkes, uh, or something Wilkes. Um, and the two would never speak to each other, Dr. Johnson and Wilkes. Mm -hmm. So Boswell very cleverly arranges a dinner party in which the two will be seated side by side and can't, can't avoid each other. And so here they are, and they both, it, it suddenly becomes in, uh, rather impossible to totally cut someone who's going to be sitting next to you for three hours. <laughs> So they're finally forced into conversation. And here's Boswell across his table with his uh, hands under the table with a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, greedily uh, uh, devouring the morsels that fall from, their, fall from their lips. Well, it's marvelous reading because he tells it as a story. He creates character. Yeah. Uh, he gives you the actual dialogue. Oh, you do feel you're there. there. You, it, it's uh, such very real reporting. It backfired on him once. He had taken Johnson to Scotland, and Johnson had his anti-Scottish prejudices. Oh, that's right. And yeah. Boswell was mostly Scottish. And um, one of his definitions in the dictionary is of oats, a, a grain in England fed to the horses, but in Scotland consumed by the people, and so on. <laughs> and uh, so Boswell had choreographed a whole day in Edinburgh for Johnson. 
to show him the best side. And Johnson was responding remarkably positively, but he kept him too long on the streets. And Edinburgh was still, even at that late date, following the practice of emptying the slops out the windows. Look out below, look out below, look out below, and then out they come, and they had the center drain in the street. And so all the stench was rising up. And most other cities had abandoned this. And Boswell's embarrassed, because here was his glorious Edinburgh, and Johnson there. And and he was waiting for Johnson to launch into an attack, and Johnson was perfectly quiet until finally uh, he simply said, Boswell, I smell you in the dark. <laughs> 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 but uh, I think that uh, Boswell did that, and I think that probably is good reporting, except that don't you think sometimes journalists today, though, do that to the extent that they're really manipulative in getting people sometimes to play roles or say things that they don't really mean to say or do? Well, I think that that is really has been something that um, has been with us for at least 100 years in American journalism. Uh, Daniel Borston, in his book, The Image, brings out a um, point that I think is quite valid. He says that the first of the non-events in journalism was the newspaper interview. Uh, this was an invention of the, late, of the latter part of the 19th century in which it, in some enterprising journalist said, well, it's a slow day. I think I'll corner so-and-so and just ask him a bunch of questions, some politician, and try to get something out of him. And so if you can confront somebody, uh, particularly a politician, with enough questions and get him spouting off enough, you can usually pick up something uh, and turn it into news. The, the deceptive part of this, and it still goes on continually, uh, is that you can keep pressing anybody if he'll respond to you. And most politicians will try to respond to the press. Uh, if you ask him enough questions and you will finally are going to come up with a, at least a snippet of an answer uh, that can, uh, that some form of news can be uh, uh, squeezed yeah. out of. So that what uh, so often happens is that some, uh, somebody who had no intention of making a statement on anything Fine. Uh, yes, will, be, uh, uh, will be asked, well, now, what is your opinion of, of SALT too? Well, I, well, would you say that there are any dangers in SALT II. Well, yes, there are certainly some dangers in uh, SALT II. Uh, the next day in the newspapers, they headline, yeah. <laughs> Representative <laughs> so-and-so warns of dangers yeah. in yeah. SALT II. Yeah. Now, this, I, I've worked, I worked in newspapers for Well, that years. is certainly manipulative. And well, this was good or not bad reporting, it's manipulative. It is reporting. manipulative, and it, uh, it really is the result of the, of, of the journalistic non-event. Now the world is full of journalistic non-events. Like the television interview. The, tele, uh, the television <laughs> interview. We, I mean, I think it's good to keep traditions going once they get uh, started, Walter. We, we can't, uh, you can't always uh, dam up the river. No, can you? it's become, um, people depend on but it. But we are so enlightened. That, uh, but don't you think with television, it just plays such a major role in people's lives that I think for many people it isn't real until they see it on television. Well, it is coming to, it, it is coming to that. And television has become one of the great galvanizers of everybody. Um, when I was working on newspapers, at, uh, particularly New York Herald Tribune, it finally became very um, disheartening to see that there were many people out there in the world who would react only to television. I remember going to cover the opening of the New York World's Fair in 1964. And there were all sorts of protesters, and to, t and to tell you the truth, I cannot remember what they were protesting about, but... They can't either. Yeah, you, no. Nobody, they can't remember right now. Um, and they were all, when I arrived, they were all outside the gates of the fair. It hadn't opened yet. Slouched up against this cyclone fence with their placards kind of draped next to their ears like this, and half asleep. And I went up and started asking questions. What are you, what are you people, uh, uh, what... What are your views on the opening of the fair? Ah, well, I just didn't really want to get into it yet. Suddenly, here comes the ABC television crew. <laughs> and it was as if these people had been wired and the ABC television crew had the switch. When the television camera came out of that, to the back of this van, suddenly, these people were electrified. They came to life. They had sort of 150-watt bedside lamp eyeballs uh, gleaming. Uh, they, were, uh, they were practically a... a in, as if they had electrical currents go through every, every inch of their central nervous system. And they started to chant. 
Well, that's what. And, and well, and now it finally reaches the point that in Iran today, we are seeing the fulfillment of Marshall McLuhan's dictum that terrorism and hostage taking is a very inexpensive and ingenious device Absolutely. by which any two armed people can take over a billion dollar industry uh, and use it to their heart's content with the complete cooperation of the owners and employees of that industry. And of course he was talking about NBC, ABC, uh, and, and CBS. And that's how the drama is being played out. It's got to, it, it reached the point where the Ayatollah Khomeini knew the ratings of different American television personalities. Therefore, Mike Wallace of CBS got 60, literally 60 minutes with the Ayatollah, whereas the poor fellows from NBC got only 15 minutes. Their ratings were so uh, were so bad. It's very a very carefully uh, orchestrated thing. And the United States' first retaliation in the midst of this television drama was to do what? Send Barbara Walters in to see the Shah and to come in New York Hospital and to come out with the word that the Shah would just as soon be in Mexico if no one minded. I think I just heard something about Mexico not going to take him back now. That's all we need. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, in a way, these people run, run the networks because the networks need, always need news, and, uh, and it really puts them in the driver's seat. Uh, you, um, you said uh, that you mentioned earlier in this whole question of style how success in a style can become a box that, that, that fences you in. You build your own trap in a way. But actually, I, I think often you and other writers are victims of stereotypes that are, are unjustified because what I have read of your work, uh, you seem to, I think you shift styles quite a bit depending on, on your subject. I, I see you writing differently when the subject seems to call for a different style. You, you well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say it because it is something that I have tried to do. Uh, if I'm writing about Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters and the whole psychedelic or hippie world, uh, I want to wind up the style to reach some kind of intensity that will match the experience I'm writing about. If I'm writing, on the other hand, about the astronauts, about test pilots, uh, I want to have a somewhat calm, although I would hope colorful, style that would approximate more the voice, the tenor of these, uh, of these men. One tends to be remembered by the most um, bizarre or extreme stance that one takes or the style that one adapts so that I find that the wildest performances of mine will be, will be remembered and I will be characterized by that. So there was a, a piece I wrote in which I um, began a sentence by repeating the word hernia 57 times. Um, in fact, I made sure the word was repeated until you had to turn the page to find out what would happen next. Uh, this was a device I used in a story about Las Vegas. And the hernia sound, hernia, 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 was the, to me, somehow, in a rhythmic way, captured the sounds of the casinos, the croupiers, the slot machines, this were constant droning repetition that goes on in the, in the casinos. And also the hernia, the, the word itself somehow, in a, in, a, in a way that's not exactly specific, um, I suppose in my mind was representing the kind of rupture of, of, of civilization that I was looking at in the uh, that's almost a, a slip or slump into Warholism, isn't it? <laughs> well, I wrote those words, sir. I hadn't heard of Andy Warhol. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, it, you're <laughs> responsible for him, then. <laughs> uh, but do people wouldn't know that, though, would they, until they got to the next page? <laughs> well, I figured anybody would finish a sentence that began with the word hernia. Hernia, just to see if the, if in fact the writer had gone. <laughs> Berserkers or not. And I, I think that the, the, the device did work, and it turns out that the man who threw his eyes, the scene was being portrayed, was uh, 
high on uppers and downers, as mm -hmm. they are, are, are now known. And that also seemed to me that I should try to approximate in the rhythms of what I wrote. So you the try nature. to get people to yeah. really, well, I guess what any good writer does, really, this is one more handle of getting them to smell and feel and see and experience what you're writing about. And, and it's a little discouraging. Now I say if I write about the uh, um, astronauts, and I don't use techniques of that sort, I don't repeat hernia. Uh, 50 times, and then people will say, "Well, he's really subsided. He's really, uh, he's really turned the corner now. He must be getting older. Uh, he's, he's, it's, it's more, it's a, it's a more conservative style. It's just simply a different use of style in, think, in my mind. They probably think you've grown. I know someone I used to uh, sit on a committee with regularly. We always disagreed, and he always implied that somehow I wasn't." mature. And then one day I agreed with him. And as we left the meeting, he put his arm <laughs> in my shoulder and says, my Walt, how you've grown. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's like, uh, what was it, Mark Twain's famous uh, uh, remark. He said, I was afflicted as a young man with a terribly ignorant and repressive father. Hmm. Uh, said, I was 16 when I fully realized what an idiot my father was. He says, therefore, it was quite a uh, I was really quite uh, uh, impressed to see how, by when I was 25 about how much the old man had improved. You know, that's, that's, that's the years, right. yeah. uh, While you were you, you were saying something to one of the students in in one of our recent um, discussion sessions that was one of the handles you have used in analyzing society and and in your social satire. And and I think how do your subjects react first of all because you tend to satirize some of the people that perhaps don't expect to be satirized in the sense that people who are on the forefront of what they think is chic or mm -hmm. fashionable and feel they're really in are precisely the ones, of course, that need <laughs> to be looked at ironically. But the ones that are apt to be most offended at it, I, th I think, do you get a lot of nasty reactions? Oddly enough, the piece that I wrote that brought me the fiercest reaction uh, was the painted word, and which was not really a very personal portrait of people in the art in the art world. It somehow it touched a, a nerve. Um, and I found myself being insulted so often in print, I finally began collecting all the insults and categorizing them by subject in order to keep them straight. There were many, many animal references, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I suppose horse's ass is an animal uh, reference. I'm uh, not absolutely, well, I guess it's an animal. Uh, you're partially correct. Yes. There were others that I first thought were animal references, but I finally figured out it had to be classified into vile substances. So they, that was... Uh, well, nothing kills a good satire or a good satirist uh, as quickly, though, as being too careful of other people's feelings. I, you, you, you've you got to touch some nerves or you're not doing the charm. Well, David Levine, the cartoonist and caricaturist, who I think is the most brilliant, mm -hmm. well, I guess a lot of people would, would uh, have the same feeling, the most brilliant caricaturist in the country, told me one day, he says, you know, it's really discouraging to do a caricature of some public figure and think that you have just skewered him and pinned him to the wall and that he will be seen forevermore as the animal you've created out of his likeness. To have him call you up the next morning and say, David, loved it, loved it. Mm -hmm. Can I, is there any way that I can buy the original? But that's part uh, of the whole celebrity thing. Again, I think I said the other night when I was speaking of, of your work that, uh, that to some extent you both polished and demolished uh, these myths and, uh, and uh, celebrity um, Shibboleths, and in a sense, I think often even being well criticized is part of of being noticed and uh, and taken. Well, we yeah, we are in a uh, a period in which people are impressed if someone is is simply mentioned in the uh, in the newspapers or on even television. Even in an unfavorable it doesn't, it doesn't really. They have to have they have to have committed an in obviously indictable crime before it isn't, really it isn't somehow a positive, uh, uh, a positive thing. And even then, they can certainly turn it around, can't they? As oh, they the can. recent senator who felt it was a, a great vindication of his career uh, when, oh, well, when he was censured. And well, look at, all the, look at all the bestsellers that came from out of uh, Watergate. Mm -hmm. 
first there was the spectacle of the bad guys' books. And there was John Dean's book and his wife's book. And then, of course, Nixon had his Kids will book. Kids right um, Haldeman and Ehrlichman both <laughs> had uh, books. Let's see. Colson wrote a book. Uh, McCord, one of the original water, uh, uh, E. Howard Hunt. Now, they all wrote books, and many of them were, were big bestsellers. Um, but in fairness to these people, it should be pointed out, they were mainly paying their lawyers. The, the criminal lawyer today is unlike the criminal lawyer of yesterday used to say, your money or your life. And they would make people sign over their homes, their cars, everything they possessed to the lawyer in return for his defending them against a charge of which they were usually completely guilty. Uh, today, it's your life or your book contract. Yeah. That's and, right. And the lawyer will tie up the book contract as a form of payment. Now, but what was more interesting to me in, in the case of Watergate was that it wasn't just the bad guys paying off their lawyers who do, jumped for these book contracts. It was also the good guys, the sheriffs. You know, his, uh, his probity, Leon Jaworski. Mm -hmm. But he's uh, got a he, he He wrote two books um, based on Watergate, and they were big bestsellers. Now, in fairness to him, I should say that his first book, I don't know the second one, the, f the proceeds were, were to be shunted to the Leon Jaworski Family Foundation. I have no idea what that is, but that's, uh, that was in the... Uh, but Samuel Dash, the counsel, chief legal counsel for War the Senate Watergate Committee, wrote a book, and I don't think that money went to anybody but, uh, but uh, the Honorable Samuel uh, Dash. Um, Judge Sirica wrote uh, uh, a book, a bestseller, about uh, Watergate. Now, what is a little disturbing about this is that there is going to be no book contract, usually on either side, but especially on the side of the prosecution, unless the defendants are found guilty. Because <laughs> otherwise, if they're found innocent, but all the material, uh, the material becomes libelous. They'll only be able to pay if they're guilty. And only be able to pay if they're That's like the old uh, Rafael joke, you know, the fellow who uh, stole the 50 chickens, and the lawyer says, if you're really innocent, I'll take your case, and finally gets around the subject of paying them, and the fellow says, well, I can give you 25 chickens. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's going to be the same way with these books. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask you, and I really don't think we have more than maybe just a minute to, to mention it, but you said to one of the students that you use status as one of your handles mm -hmm. to see how people relate to each other. I thought that was interesting. I read a fascinating book by Tiger and Fox, of all people, mm -hmm. Lionel Tiger, on, on, on the higher Abes. <laughs> but he, they were saying that even in these groups, that tremendously subtle distinctions of status, mainly between the older males and the younger mm -hmm. males and the females, but even within those groups, that that was often what the whole group of apes revolved around. And you seem to suggest maybe that's a primate tendency. Yes. I feel it's a constant of human life and that there are fundamental f matters of r status, which is simply to say the way people rank one another at work in every area of human life. It doesn't matter whether you're writing about students, politicians where it becomes obvious, or astronauts where it wasn't hmm. obvious. It becomes a absolutely vital, uh, a vital thing to look for. And I, so I, I, that's the way I always start. I'll get into a situation. Course. I'll say, what are the status factors Social. here? And then the, uh, once you establish that, other things tend to become clearer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Walter. For joining me on Community Camera. I wish we had another half hour. I do, too. Let's You've just, been through a strenuous three here. days. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say, uh, before we close, to remind people to uh, look, uh, look at your uh, newspapers uh, in the spring for Ray Brady, uh, business correspondent for CBS, uh, Haywood Hale Brune, uh, social and sports commentator, and the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who will be continuing our Visiting Scholars series in the spring. We've had a wonderful time while you've been here, Tom. It's, it's been great. Hope to see you again. Well, my thanks to you all, because I really enjoyed it more than I can tell you. Thank you. My guest has been Tom Wolfe, and this is Walter Smith uh, signing off for Community Camera.